What's the word, y'all? On this channel, it's just me and a bunch of NBA opinions. Today, I wanted to give you the floor. I wanted you to give me takes or opinions, so I tweeted this. Ask me NBA cues for a video or give me takes to react to. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm giving you the microphone for a second. I'm snatching out of your hand to tell you if I agree or disagree with what you're saying. At the end of the day, remember, I'm just one guy with some NBA opinions. You might disagree, which is completely okay. It is just basketball at the end of the day. Leave a like, subscribe if you're new, use that comment section. I want to hear everything you have to say. If there's one question in here that you're super passionate, about i'm looking through those comment sections i want to hear what you got to say but before we get into the first one i want to remind you that these videos are sponsored by prize picks they've been a presenting sponsor on this channel for the entirety of the 2021 22 season and that's not gonna end because i really do love what they got going on over there of course it is just you versus the numbers before the game start i always load up the prize pick app and i'm trying to pick the right entry so hit that link in the description download the prize picks app and use code kenny because they're matching all deposits up to 100 for new players of course we are nba people around here but they got a lot of different stuff they got the nfl college football they got pga tennis csgo you want to make an entry about csgo you can do that on prize picks so me and the homies have an entire group chat of a bunch of us that we talk about our entries and stuff and spoiler alert i am in first place because i'll be doing stuff like this so this is from a little while ago i want to show you the versatility i put together a five player flex play as you can see bogdanovich did not hit his, hit his over like i wanted him to but since I got four out of the five people to hit their overs, boom, I'm still in the green. At the end of the day, it's just super fun. So hit that link in the description and download the Prize Picks app and use code Kenny and join the already over thousands of people that use code Kenny already in this channel. I mentioned this before. I love the product so much that a couple months after us working together, I became an investor. Like I am a real firm believer of Prize Picks, so I really want y'all to dive in if you haven't already and send me your wins when you get that. Man, I love seeing people eat. Question number one comes from Kevin O'Connor of the Ringer. Should the Bulls give up Patrick Williams in a trade for Jeremy Grant? Shout out to KOC because he knows my answer to this question because he texted me like three days ago. But he knows I'm filming a video. He knows I want to talk about the Bulls. So here we go. I want to preface this by saying, like I said in a couple videos ago, no matter what the front office of the Chicago Bulls do at the trade deadline, I'm going to be behind them until they show me otherwise. So if they do trade Patrick Williams for Jeremy Grant, boom, I'm here for it. If they don't, boom, I'm here for it. But this is my opinion about it. Again, I'm not the president of Bulls fandom. I know a bunch of Bulls fans that would love to see this trade happen. But here's my reservations with it. Um, Jeremy Grant is a very, very good NBA player. And I understand the, the idea of him leveling our ceiling because we need a big wing that can guard other positions. We haven't played Giannis uh, this season so far, and I'm sure that Giannis is going to kill us. And Jeremy Grant, with his size, not going to stop Giannis, but he'll be the best option that we have. I understand that. The only thing is, like, when I look at the Chicago Bulls, other than the big wing thing, we struggle with our rebounding. Jeremy Grant does not rebound the ball whatsoever. The reason he left the the Denver Nuggets is because he wanted to be the number one, number two option. If he came to the Chicago Bulls, bro will be back at the four option, the five option. We have to figure out if he's willing to go back to that because he's only got a couple more years left in his contract. So even if we trade for him, yeah, he's under contract for a few seasons, but if bro want to do the same thing and go to another team to get a bigger role again, he could do that. And it just scares me a little bit to, to give up a lot of our future for a guy that could potentially walk. But I understand the idea of like, hey, the Bulls are the one seed. Let's go all in. I understand that. But it's a little bit scary. I would love that the, if there was more people on the market or better people on the market for it. That's just not the way it works. Like, if we can get Jeremy Grant to say, yeah, I'm good, bro. I want to be the four option again because I went to Detroit as the one option and I ain't won a game since. If we could get him to say, I'm okay with being a role player, a glorified role player, then boom, I'm here for it. But it just scares me a little bit. That's that's all. I mean, it wouldn't matter, grand scheme, if they made that trade and the Bulls won a championship. I don't care. You could walk the next year. The whole team could be going the next year. We won a championship. But those are the type of things, like I said, that's why I'm relying on the front office to make the decision because I literally do not know. I just talk about hoops. I'm not I'm not really in tune with it like that. You feel me? And I understand the idea that um, the production that we would get from Jeremy Grant is tenfold to what you're getting from Patrick Williams right now. But as a firm believer of Patrick Williams and, and, and what he could be as an NBA player, you know, maybe it's, maybe Patrick Williams needs to go to a team like Detroit to get the full version of himself. Maybe it's the best option for him as an NBA player. But, it, you know what I'm saying? We, we shall see what happens at the trade deadline. Brady says, who is your favorite young core in the NBA? Um, the only answer is the Cleveland Cavaliers. I've, I've mentioned it many times on this channel that I don't miss Cavs games very often because I really do love Evan Mobley. Um, I interviewed Evan Mobley back in California over the summer, and when I was interviewing him, I had no idea that he was about to be this good. Again, as a guy that doesn't watch much college basketball, I watched some film on him because if I'm going to do an interview of a person, I want to be sure that I know at least a little bit, but I didn't know he was going to transition to the NBA just like that. The man, if you ask me, should be in um, all defensive team conversations as a rookie, and that means a lot because if I'm not mistaken, 
mistaken, that hasn't been done very often. If I, it might have been Tim Duncan as the last dude. That's how great of a player he is. And I see him when I watch him, even though he doesn't have great games back to back to back to back, I see the flashes of how good this player can be. And I'm invested. Jared Allen, people looked at him as like, man, you gave $100 million to a dude that might be the 12th best center in the entire league. The man is on the trajectory. He's going to be an all-star this season, more than likely. Darius Garland might not be an all-star this season, but he looks like he's going to be an all-star next season. Year after that, year after that. They have such a nice little core and also some pieces around them that like, hey, if we wanted to go completely in, we have draft pick, we have draft capital, we still have young players that maybe we not necessarily giving up on, but some teams might value a little bit more if we want to go out and get a piece. Now, I'm not saying they're doing that at this deadline, even though some people are predicting it. I don't think they do that this year. They still have to figure out the Colin Sexton thing, but as far as like visually, which core looks the most fun to watch, it's them. And I think they get an advantage mostly because they're winning games, right? Like, like the Houston Rockets have a solid core for the future, but they're so far away from being a playoff team while the Cavs are a young team with a young core that is in the playoffs right now. Kid said, too soon take. LeBron at center is amazing for the Lakers. I think it proves that he can play any position. Small ball has been around for a while, but it's different when the big is also the smartest and best passer on the team. I agree. The only problem is, is that your second best player is also a center. So like, yeah, <laughs> LeBron at small ball center right now is great. It's been working and they're on the win streak right now. But long term, you're not going to run small ball center when they're closing out games because your second best player is Anthony Davis. You know what I'm saying? And the reason why Anthony Davis don't love playing center is that it takes a big toll on the body. I, I like as good as it has been. I don't want 37 year old LeBron James playing small ball center for the entire season and the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? It works right now because Anthony Davis is out and, and, and it's been looking good. But I think for the sake of his body and for the team's success once playoffs come around, this is not something you should look at as like, yeah, we doing this every single night. LeBron playing 40 minutes at the five. It, should, it shouldn't be like that. Dominic says if Josh Giddy was American, he'd be in the lead for rookie of the year. This is weird. That was very weird to me. And that's why I screenshotted it. That is a take that doesn't make much sense to me. Because I'm, I'm again... It, it made me like squint my eyes because I don't. Okay. Luka Doncic, Ben Simmons, Andrew Wiggins, um, technically Kyrie Irving. These are non American born players that that won rookie of the year. Are we, are we saying that the, are we, Pal Gasol did it in 2001, 2002? I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with where he's from, my boy, especially when a lot of the MVP ladders have Franz Wagner right now. He's German. I don't think. Josh Giddy not being American is the reason why he's not the rookie of the year. I just think that there are rookies playing better than him. That's not saying he's bad because he's far from bad. But Franz Wagner has been better this season. Evan Mobley has been better this season. Scotty Barnes has been better this season. It's nothing wrong with being the fourth best rookie in a very good class. This class is amazing. You know what I'm saying? And that's just based off right now. He's had the triple double. He's the youngest player to ever get a triple double. He had the double double with zero points. Those are amazing feats. I mean, the second one is cool. I wouldn't count it as amazing to not be able to score in the NBA game, but 11 assists and 10 rebounds is dope. But I don't, I don't understand it. That's why I screenshot it. And, and I wanted, I wanted people in the comment section to maybe flush out what he's thinking because we've seen so many foreign board players succeed in the NBA. That it's just weird that he would say, nah, it's cause he's foreign. Specifically Australian. Ben Simmons was just rookie of the year for like three years in a row. Man, that joke is so tired, but I'm, I'm gonna say it every once in a while, I'll be honest with you. Jaden says, RJ Barrett progressing has been held back by the Knicks being competitive now. John Zion were given the keys to be the first and second option. RJ has flashes, but only do so much behind Randall, Kemble, Fournier, et cetera. I understand what you're saying completely, but I think that once we look back on the draft class, even if you go back in real time, a lot of people saw it as a two person draft and, and there was like a gap between Ja, Zion, and RJ. Not saying that they didn't, people didn't believe he could be a star because I'm still not off that train either. But the reason that Ja and Zion are so great, of course, situation does matter, but they were also like really, really talented and had things that they were already great at coming into the league and then was able to round out. Oh, I'm more talking about Ja at this point because we ain't seen Zion in so long. They had things that they were very elite at and that has to do with the speed of Ja Moran. His, his vision as a rookie was really, really good. And those things were good and then he continued to flesh out the rest of his game, and now he's a 40% three-point shooter. So, like, it was a two-player draft where people were still believing that RJ could be great. Situations do matter, but those two prospects were just seem like miles ahead of RJ. Beyond says, I think people underestimate the talent this young Rockets team has. This rebuild will be a pretty fast one. I don't know, man. Rebuilding the NBA is typically not 
fast. Um, and I don't think, I think a lot of people recognize the amount of talent or raw, I mean like literally raw talent that's on the team. With Jalen Green, especially right now, he's shooting like 50% on threes in the last X amount of games where I've attempted eight of them. He's been great. If you ask any draft nerd, everybody love um, Sengun coming out of the draft if you were a draft nerd. Josh Christopher, people love. Kevin Porter Jr., people know that he's talented but has the other stuff that's going on. Christian Wood, like people understand the talent level that's on the team. It's a more about the gelling and how do you flesh out this much young talent to all be in the right lane for them to be successful? Now, honestly, I think we're going to talk about this in a question that we get to a little bit later, so I don't want to spoil any things, but it's hard to be a team that is super young with a bunch of draft picks and a bunch of 19 and 20 year olds in a row and be like, yes, they click in a year number two and we in the playoffs again, especially right now where it seems like a lot of teams are super well rounded. So is the, the part of you saying that this rebuild will be pretty fast, I would be surprised if it was. This feels like a rebuild that's going to take, I mean, I don't know what, what you mean by fast. I think that's relative. But if you're trying to say to me like in two years, the Raptors are, or the Rockets are back to a playoff team, I would be hesitant to say that. Peter says, do you know anyone personally from school or where you grew up that played or had a chance to play in the NBA? I'm going to be honest with you, Peter. Where I grew up, um, there are a lot of great basketball players. None of them really made it out, which is unfortunate. Um, once I moved to the suburbs, I got to play against some players that I knew had the ability to maybe go pro. And one of them is in the G League right, right now. He's, he's the homie Mike Smith. He plays for the Sioux Falls Sky Force. Uh, he played for uh, the Miami Heat Summer League team this year. I, before Mike, Mike was one of my friends, I guarded him in eighth grade. He's a year younger than me. So he's a seventh grade player in eighth grade. And I don't even know if he remembers this. I don't talk about this because it's kind of low-key, kind of embarrassing. Um, but I, I transferred to this to the school in eighth grade. I went from <laughs> I went from an all-black school from the first X amount of years of my life until I got to eighth grade, where I went to a school where it was me and three other three other black people in the whole school, right? Um, <laughs> three other black people in the whole school, and we all were on the basketball team, which I mean stereotypes or whatever. Um, but my coach, Coach Re Coach Rear, in this first game going against Mike Smith and his team was like, hey, I need you to guard this guy. He wasn't even pointing at Mike. He's pointing at another guy that was in eighth grade. He was like 6'3 point guard in eighth grade. He's like, Kenny, you need to guard him. Mind you, as of right now, as an adult, I am 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, so imagine me in eighth grade, how tall I was. Right, okay, so boom. I got to guard this six foot plus guy. But the six foot plus guy wasn't even trying to hoop. He was giving it to Mike to hoop. So coach is like, coach is like, Kenny, or I guess nobody called me Kenny until I was adult. He was like, uh, uh, Contrell, I need you to guard that guy. I'm like, bet. Literally. Back-to-back -back possessions, Mike put me in the basket and one, put me in foul trouble, had to sit the entire second quarter. In that moment, I was like, yeah, this guy's really, really good, and he has a chance to go pro. And here he is, really having a chance to go pro. So it's really cool to see him go out there and hoop. Aiden says, assuming Clay is back when you film this video, how do you think he's going to impact the Warriors, especially in the playoffs, when he's got him back into NBA shape? Oh, yeah. With Clay Thompson coming back the day this video is released, a lot of the questions were Clay Thompson related. Um, and to answer your question, I don't really know, man. Um, I, w I wish it was as simple as me saying, yeah, Clay's coming back, so he about to be 100%. The Warriors about to do this and that, but I, I, tr I try to be more realistic. And, and when you're missing basketball for 600 plus days, more likely than not, there's going to be a period of time where you're getting things back. Now, Clay Thompson is the type of dude that I feel like if he had no legs, he would still be the one of the greatest shooters of all time. So I feel like that thing might be cool, but it's all the other things. He was one of the better the perimeter defenders in the entire league. That might be down now that he suffered two leg injuries you know um i like how the warriors are trying to slow roll or try to slow roll it we're like once we got news that clay thompson might be coming back in a week or so they were like okay jordan Poole, even though you're good enough to start on us now we're gonna have you roll to the bench because that's your role now and let's get used to you coming off the bench again and the first game they did that he had like 30 you know what i'm saying um just adding a guy like clay thompson even if he's 80 percent of himself 70 percent of himself is a w for a team that already is one of the deeper teams in the league no more glue guys in the nba all-star game averaging nine seven and five is not an all-star um i'm gonna assume this is him talking about draymond green obviously no other guy is even in conversations averaging less than 10 points um i just i don't think that's true Though the All-Star game is about entertainment, it's bigger than that. You know, we're talking about players' legacies. We're talking about players' Hall of Fame candidacy. We're talking about players' contracts. So sure, is Draymond Green the most fun player to have in the All-Star game? No. But he has been one of the best 24 players in the NBA this season. Regardless if he's only averaging 8 points. Because you you, you you played my boy a little bit when it came to his stats. It's 8 points, 8 rebounds, and 7.5 assists. Don't forget it. He is not just a glue guy. He's the ultimate glue guy. 
and he's the best defensive player in the league this season. Basketball is more than just let me score a bunch of points. Draymond Green has the ability to win games strictly on his own court coaching, his defense, and his playmaking. Legit, I'm not, and that's no exaggeration. Of course, he needs Steph Curry to hit shots. He needs Jordan Poole to hit shots once he gets the ball. Yes, it takes a whole team. But if Draymond Green, what he was doing was so insignificant, we'd have 10 Draymond Greens across the league. In reality speaking, there's one Draymond Green. There's one player who is sitting at 6'6", six, six, power forward, that could guard almost every position on the court. There's one player sitting at 6'6", six, six, at the power forward position, that is looked to really orchestrate the offense. There's one player at 6'6", six, six, that is leading the league in defensive player of the year as a four. Like, it is way deeper than, oh, he not scoring enough points. And what type of message would it show to the people that's coming up in the league if we have a player who is arguably the greatest defensive player of this decade? Like, arguably. I'm not saying he is, but arguably the greatest defensive player of this decade and the league, like, nah, you just, you don't deserve to be an all-star. That would just tell me, shit, shit, why, did I, why do I have to do anything on the defensive side of the ball if it doesn't matter? If, if I'm not going to get rewarded for other than maybe being a defensive player to your conversations. We talk about resumes, we talk about a lot of different things. Draymond Green deserves to be there, my boy. Especially, look, I made my all-star ballot video a couple days ago. The Western Conference is kind of mid when it comes to the forward position anyway. You feel me? Nikola Jokic is overrated. He plays zero perimeter defense. It has no rim protection. Only gets steals. Derrick Jones Jr., this is not the official DJJ because I think if I asked DJJ right now, if I, I DM'd him, um, do you think Jokic is good or, or one of the best players in the league? He would say yes because he's played against him for a few seasons. You're, you're spewing a bunch of like old, tired narratives. The idea that Jokic is not a plus or even an okay defender, it's like three years old, my boy. Jokic, Jokic has been a good defender for the past couple seasons, and he's getting better and better. He has zero perimeter defense. I'm not expecting him to, to have 100 perimeter defense. He doesn't have zero, but I'm not expecting him to be the best perimeter defensive player of, on the team. He is not a rim protector, but I'm telling you, I've said this on the channel before. There are two different types of centers that are good on defense. There are rim protectors, and there are paint protectors. When I'm thinking rim protectors, well, I guess Rudy Gobert is both, and that's why he's a guy that wins the defensive player all the time. But, like, you think a traditional rim protector is a guy like JaVale McGee, Hassan Whiteside, that's going to get hella blocks. But a paint protector is a guy like Al Horford in his prime, where he might not get a ton of blocks, but you know you're not scoring a lot of points in the, in the, in the paint because he is such a smart positional defender in the paint. Jokic is a paint defender. He might not average two blocks a game ever in his career. But he has not been a, a, a minus defender in years. And that's the eye test. That's the advanced stats. That's everything. Him being overrated is wild to me. And that just tells me you haven't watched him at all this season. Because the team goes with him. And if he has a, a even subpar night, they have no chance to win a basketball game. And that's on the offensive and the defensive side of the ball. That was fun, wasn't it? You know? You might disagree with everything I said in this video. That's completely okay. We're just humans that, that like the game of basketball. Um, I'm going to remind you to enjoy it. You could like it, but some of y'all like it, but don't enjoy it, if you know what I'm saying. So enjoy basketball. Go out there and watch some games today. Klay Thompson comes back tonight. I'm excited about that one. And the Bulls are going for win number 10 in a row, if I'm not mistaken, against, against Dallas. Tune in, baby. See Red.